curvature. The, the curvature matters only below the cell field, right? Cell field at high temperature is very small. So we can just exclude. At high field. High, yeah. You know. Here, you know. This shaded region is a cell field region, right? At 25K, cell field region is here. Actually, here, yeah, it's different. Because, you know, cell field, we can easily calculate it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, you know, well here, you know, the, the, well, suppression of JC due to the curvature of the vortices is definitely can be excluded because the field range is quite different. Okay. So when you quote these numbers for JC, mm -hmm. It is average. Average, and also we didn't take uh, into account the, the tilting, because uh, you know, no, here we only tilt uh, up to 20 or 30 degrees. Maybe we need to well, correct this value. But it's not very much a uh, correction. Well, we, when we have spray, vortex motion across this spray plane is difficult. That means this JC becomes a higher. Uh, that we don't know because, <laughs> well, we cannot. No, 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 no. You have to compare parallel columnar defects and spread columnar defects to do that. But we cannot directly compare. We have never tried the, the uh, irradiation in sing single piece of crystal, parallel and spread. If we do it, I can tell the answer. Okay. Uh, Martian, last question. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I remember that paper. But well, I can tell you all these crystals. Of course, uh, uh well, to confirm uh the, the penetration. No, 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 no. no uh, all all the crystals are very thin. Frustration and stability of vortex matter via network science. Thank you, Elio. Um, is this on? <laughs> it will be. So, um, first of all, let me uh, thank uh, Wilson and Mauro for um, the uh, uh, wonderful uh, hospitality, not just to towards me, but my family as well. We are having a great time. And uh, let's hope you will have a great time as long as the paper presentation shows up. So. Um, just make sure I don't run out of time. Let me uh, thank my collaborators. Basically, most of the work that we're pre presenting is uh, done by uh, my graduate student, Shao Yuma. He is a uh, very uh, dynamic young um, uh, colleague who actually has a long-standing collaboration with the Argon Group, in particular with Yong Lei Wang. Um, he uh, also collaborates with uh, uh, my colleague, uh, from Network Science, Zoltan Torotskoy, and uh, he's also working with the Reicharts on uh, skirmion physics. So, um, here is basically the um, uh, list of three points that I would like to uh, address today. Um, let's take a look at uh, what can we do with uh, a hybrid system that has a superconducting component and, and it has a uh, uh, permaloy um, array of magnets on it. Worked on, on hybrid system for quite some time, but this may be uh, the, uh, the best we've seen. Okay, um, then let's take a look at uh, something that may be uh, at the first glance uh, irrelevant, uh, uh, the network science and its connection to energy landscape uh, uh, um, investigations, uh, and, and then see how we can use what we learned from, uh, say, Leonard Jones clusters to say uh, something useful about uh, the uh, vortex matter under confinement. Okay, so um, since uh, I mentioned our collaboration with, with Yong Lei, uh, let me just show some of his um, uh, samples. He um, was one of the first who actually reproduced the uh, conformal pinning uh, configuration that uh, Charles and Cynthia and Dipanjan uh, uh, worked on, something that, that uh, we were interested a couple of years ago. 
But Young Lake can, as you know, um, prepare other samples with, with either random pinning or, for example, square pinning. These are all um, interesting on their own, but the point is, uh, once you're done with this configuration, that's it. There's no way you could uh, change the uh, pinning configuration. Now, in the meantime, Yong Lei was working on, um, on a uh, thermal array. This is the SEM uh, image of the sample that he, um, he made. The uh, results are, uh, have been published last year in Science. Um, so what you see here is uh, uh, permaloid bars, basically about 300 nanometers long. I think the, uh, the width is about uh, 80 nanometers, the thickness is 25, you know, fairly small. Um, and then he noticed that if, uh, if uh, the polarizing in-plane field that doesn't need to be too big, you know, uh, I'm told about 75 uh, millitesla would you will switch these, uh, these domains these small permaloid uh, magnets, uh, he, can, uh, he can rotate in the, um, in the uh, XY plane, the field and polarization, he can switch the system from uh, one particular um, uh, configuration of uh, magnetization to another one, to another one, as you could tell. They are, uh, according to their work, um, about uh, eight different um, um, uh, magnetization, magnetization state, by the way, Uri should be somewhere here in the audience, right there. He will be talking about uh, the experimental aspects of, of this um, uh, permaloid array, and also the about the um, uh, hybrid, uh, when was it, on Thursday, right? Uh, Thursday afternoon. Okay, so um, now, why are we interested in this? Well, I was telling Young Lei as soon as I've seen this that if he uh, manages to take this uh, array of permaloy and slap it on top of a superconductor, he basically has a way of um, rewriting the pinning potential as, as he's uh, changing the, um, uh, the in-plane field without affecting too much the, uh, for example, the uh, uh, vortex density that is set by the um, uh, uh, field in the uh, Z direction. So here's a cartoon that, that he came up with. What you can see here is a um, depiction of the uh, uh, permaloy uh, magnets, and, and he says that he's thinking of these in terms of uh, magnetic uh, charges, positive and negative. Um, and as, as they are arranged in one particular configuration, it turns out in this particular system uh, with the um, uh, magnetic and the superconducting energy scales as they are, um, that the um, the uh, uh, magnetic charges that that are uh, shown here in blue are the one that will function as as uh, pins, and the one uh, uh, that that are depicted in red, they will be actually uh, scattering potentials. Okay, so he actually took this uh, permaloid uh, array uh, deposited on um, on molybdenum germanium. The contact, I'm told, is uh, metallic, so there are other interesting uh, things going on. But uh, it turns out that uh, we can actually model the, the vortex matter in this uh, uh, hybrid system just by looking at magnetic interaction. Okay, so what you're looking at now is a, um, a model that we are using for uh, the uh, pinning uh, potential landscape in, in different configurations of the uh, of the permaloy um, uh, array so the blue centers are uh, pinning potentials for the vortices the the, the red centers are are uh, scattering potentials and depending on which type of um, of uh, what they call magnetic spin ice configuration the the permaloy is we have uh, different um, configurations for the uh, vortex spinning potentials uh, as you may suspect, um, the problem is not that simple as, 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 as is shown here, but we basically built on uh, what um, uh, Millerad and, uh, and uh, Francois with uh, Jan Polsky did uh, in terms of modeling uh, the, the effect of a dipole on a, on a superconductor. And 
we fitted their results with with uh, uh, a Gaussian profile. Uh, it actually worked fairly well in explaining what's going on in this um, in this system. Okay, um, the um, first set of results I'd like to show you is, is basically a, um, a comparison of the um, molecular dynamic simulation um, that uh, Xiao Yu performed to explain the uh, critical current measurement that uh, Yong Lei took on this, uh, on this uh, uh, sample. I, if you take a look, uh, there is this set of data for what he calls a uh, type 1 state, and I've shown you the um, MFM image of this. And uh, in contrast to that, there's uh, the um, matching field versus current data for the type 2 configuration, and you could immediately spot the difference if you take a look at half matching field here, the type 1 configuration, you do not see uh, any features. However, if you, if you take a look at um, the same matching field for the type 1 configuration, you immediately see that, that there, are, um, uh, there are matching effects. And interestingly, the uh, molecular dynamic simulations reproduce this without any problem, but we are interested in figuring out why this happens. So, if you do a, um, um, a set of Voronoi um, uh, cell configuration for the, um, um, you know, for, for the vortex matter as you ramp up the, um, uh, the field along the z-axis from uh, 0.25 to half to all the way to um, uh, the first matching field, in the type 1 configuration you will see that you basically walk by uh, the half matching field and there's really uh, no obvious um, uh, order present. There, there's a lot of disorder here. Whereas once you get to uh, the first matching field, things look a lot better. Um, now, if you take a look at the type 2 um, uh, configuration, uh, then uh, you will see, and again, I'm, I'm sorry, it seems like uh, it's, it's not that trivial to, to, to see, um, the actual um, uh, potentials here, but uh, once you get to a uh, half uh, matching field, there is a very nice order state showing up. And that's because the vortices decide to um, park themselves right here, uh, right between two uh, attractive uh, uh, pinning potentials. That configuration is not available in the, in the type 1 case, um, so we think that's why it's absent. Now, how can we use this? Well, for example, we can um, see what happens if we drive the system in um, one direction from right to left or from left to right. And uh, you suspect that, that as soon as there's some kind of an asymmetry between uh, the potential landscape that the vortices see in, um, as they travel from one direction uh, with respect to uh, the other direction, you will have something like a ratchet effect. And uh, you can imagine uh, basically making um, uh, vortex circuit devices just by, by, by changing the configuration of these um, um, domains of uh, permolar arrays. What is behind uh, the, the ratchet effect here? If you take a look at, at this image, you see that there's a pretty uh, robust um, um, uh, fourfold uh, coordination between the vortices, whereas here there is not much. So how can we quantify this? Well, we can take a look at the uh, Voronoi cells again, but then um, Shao Yu came up with, with a different idea. He said that, why don't we uh, do something like a triangulation here and, and, and monitor what happens with the, um, uh, with the coordination between vortices as, as they flow through the um, um, pinning potential landscape. So if the um, um, coordination is more that of a square lattice, then uh, if, if I measure and perform a statistics of the angles that show up in the triangulation, I will get uh, 
uh, a lot of results with 45 degrees and, 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 and more with uh, 90 degrees. On the other hand, fairly trivially, if um, I have a hexagonal coordination, I will get um, uh, 60 degree angles in this uh, uh, numerical measurement quite a lot. Okay. Um, and he actually performed the uh, numerical measurement. This is uh, the dots are the data uh, that he obtained. He actually made a fit overall uh, to the um, uh, to the actual uh, data, and then he asked himself the following question: How can I explain this uh, by assuming that part of the uh, vortex matter is uh, coordinated in a, in a uh, hexagonal configuration, and uh, the rest is um, in a square configuration. So it he actually made a Gaussian fit for the two uh, possibilities, and it turns out that uh, for the positive drive, uh, there is less uh, configuration, 4-4 uh, uh, configuration, uh, when compared to the negative drive, uh, you could see a lot more. Um, why is this important? Well, if you go back and take a look at the um, uh, pinning potential landscape, this is basically a fourfold symmetric uh, pinning potential landscape. So uh, it's if the uh, vortex, the sliding vortex uh, matter is more in a uh, uh, fourfold coordination, then the pinning seems to be working better. Okay, um, that's fine. But then here's what uh, I think is fairly typical that that you see in uh, in a uh, uh, non-trivial pin potential landscape. Well, if you take a look at um, at the um, um, coordination of the number of vortices that show up in, in various plaquettes, even if you have a relatively simple situation where you only consider the, um, uh, the interactive potentials, and again, this is not necessarily a, a complicated uh, pinning landscape, you see that you will find uh, defects. Uh, for example, uh, at half matching field, where on average you should have one vortex per plaquette, you actually uh, find two in some cases and none in the others. If you go back to a more realistic um, uh, landscape that is um, uh, describes better the system that we have and put back the, um, uh, the um, uh, repulsive uh, potential centers, then you have even more um, even more defects. Okay? Again, it's not terribly surprising, but then, then comes the following question. Um, when we perform uh, molecular dynamic simulations and, and take a look at what happens with the uh, uh, vortex matter in this situation, we anneal slowly and get to something that uh, at least we hope to be the ground state. But the question is, is this really um, I mean, is, is there a way to make sure that, that uh, the system that, that uh, we simulated eventually um, gets to uh, the um, true ground state? And, and as far as I can tell, the answer is no. So is there anything else that we could do that, that, that uh, gives a better um, uh, snapshot of, of the um, uh, energy landscape configuration? Do we really have a different way of, of looking at finding the ground state, finding the uh, metal stable local minima, and see if, if we can understand how the system goes from one configuration to the others. And as you will see, um, uh, the transition, the so-called transition points will become uh, important. Okay, so it turns out the uh, chemists and uh, the biologists uh, worked quite a lot on, on exploring energy landscape. There are a lot more complicated than what we have here. And um, th there are methods to, uh, to find um, at least the approximate energy landscapes. And that will give us a way to uh, figure out what happens when the system is perturbed, when uh, um, uh, you turn on uh, finite temperature effects. And, and we could also look at what is called the magic number configuration. And again, this is uh, uh, connected to what uh, uh, Grigoreva did experimentally and then um, uh, 
Francois and his collaborators uh, looked at uh, several years ago uh, within the um, uh, Landau, sorry, within the London theory, but also I understand the, the uh, Gainsbourg Landau framework. Um, but I would like to do something slightly different, again, inspired by uh, uh, folks in chemical physics, and um, take a look at this problem of having n particles for simplicity in, in, in two dimensions and see what can we say about the, um, the energy function. Uh, you could immediately tell that this is not going to be easy because uh, if you have, say, 20 particles, and I'll show you an example for the results for 20 particles in a container, you have a 40-dimensional um, uh, function to monitor and, um, and evaluate. But uh, there's a way to, to, uh, uh, to describe thi this function. And again, this is just a cartoon of, of uh, how an energy landscape looks like. Uh, clearly, the minima correspond to, um, uh, to some metastable ground state, uh, metastable states. Uh, this, uh, let's say, the ground state. Uh, the, um, uh, the metastable states are in, in, a, um, um, in a valley that is separated by the others, by these ridges. And there are s uh, special points on these ridges that, that uh, we call transition points where, you know, with the minimal energy cost, the system can go from one uh, state to another. Now, if you turn this landscape upside down and we take a look at it from above, you can um, uh, provide uh, the location for the, uh, for the minima, also the, um, uh, the uh, transition points, and, and uh, the next step is to uh, connect them uh, and, and uh, bring out uh, something that looks like a network. So that th these are the, um, uh, the nodes of the network. The, these are the links. Every link should have at least one green point or one uh, uh, transition point. Um, and again, this has been done for, um, uh, for metallic clusters, for um, uh, Lennard-Jones particles by, by uh, uh, Doyle and Wales. And just as an exercise uh, introduction to the problem, we, we, we looked at their result, which is available um, online for uh, 10 Lennard-Jones particles. Uh, it turns out the uh, energy uh, landscape network looks like this, quite a mess. Um, and see what we can learn from this. Again, this is uh, not necessarily new, but what is new is a new way of, of uh, analyzing a, a network like this, and this is what I'm told is the uh, so-called K-core decomposition. So imagine uh, looking at, at uh, a network uh, like the one I've shown, and, and you start um, clipping off, taking off uh, nodes that, that are not well-connected. You could say, uh, uh, in many cases, these, these nodes are not influencing the uh, physical behavior of the systems. Not always the case, but sometimes it is. And irrespective of that, you cannot stop me from defining what is called a K-core. Uh, that is here, the definition, that is the largest subgraph where vertices have at least K interconnections. And you could tell, you start knocking these out, eventually end up with this uh, small network, uh, which is called a two-core. Now, as you start shrinking uh, the networks and, and, and keep peeling off uh, the various uh, uh, shells, you can actually define what a shell is. And the shell consists of all those nodes that, uh, uh, that, have, that correspond, that belong to a uh, K-core, that is, they belong to a, a network that has been uh, simplify to the k level, but do not belong to the k plus one. That is, you will be taking those cores away at the next step. Okay? Just be patient, you will see why I'm doing this. Um, so, uh, recently, uh, uh, there are ways of, of uh, uh, plotting the um, k core decomposition of, uh, of a particular network. Here, if you take a look at the color codes, uh, one corresponds to the least connected network the, uh, co nodes. These are the, the, the one shell, the one core, and then you keep going further down. And this is the, the uh, center of the network, the, uh, the, 
set of the most connected uh, nodes uh, in the network. Okay. There's also another index um, that you can associate uh, with a um, uh, with a node. You could without before starting to demolish uh, the entire network, you can count very simply how many uh, links, how many connections it has, and associate a certain size. And this is the uh, the size chart for for the um, um, uh, for the nodes. And there it is. Um, a uh, what is called K-core decomposition for uh, Elena Joe's particle energy network uh, uh, for uh, the number size equal to 10. Still, you may ask why on earth am I doing this? Well, take a look at this uh, plot. Um, if you then decide to use the shell index as the, as the uh, uh, variable and monitor what the energy is doing, this is uh, a cluster of 11 particles, that's 12, 13, 14. In every case, the ground state lands in the, um, uh, in the shell that corresponds to the highest K index. So it is basically the, the uh, uh, statement that we cannot prove, no one can, uh, that uh, typically the ground state is, belongs to the set of most connected uh, uh, networks uh, in the um, in this uh, uh, energy network uh, 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 analysis, okay. So I, you know, we decided it's worth uh, investigating what's happening uh, with the uh, connectivity of um, various metal stables, states and ground states in uh, in a, um, for example, in a system of 20 vortices in a square container. And I guess there's no reason to. Um, justify experimentally too much. Why am I interested in this? It's people have done experiments uh, on for vortex matter under strong confinement. For example, for 20 vortices in a square container, what we have here is a, a diagram of uh, the um, transition states, the one that, that we uh, denote with red, and the metal stable states. These are uh, labeled, I mean, they are colored with blue. The larger the uh, the network is, the um, um, the larger the, the energy is, the bigger the dot. This is the um, uh, network without the transition states. And let me just uh, slowly go through the uh, pathways just for you to show, uh, for you to see how you could connect various network. Uh, 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 positions with the actual configurations. And let me close with a snapshot of a um, vortis, vortex system in the presence of uh, pinning. So the network uh, for that system looks like this, fairly uh, strange. Uh, and as you walk through it, you see how uh, non-trivial it is to go from one system, one, one configuration to another. By contrast, this is uh, what you have without um, uh, pinning, basically the statement is that if you include pinning, the complexity uh, of the system is uh, strongly increasing. Okay, so let me just stop here. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, thank you. We have time for one question.